Okay, and I'll share my screen. Can everyone see the the paper? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so this paper is called Solving Olympiad Geometry Without Human Demonstration. So um, let's get let's get some context for why P the DeepMind even worked on this paper because solving a high school test isn't exactly um, super useful for humanity. But it's a combination of two things, the reason why they did this paper. Um, the first is that logical reasoning, especially at the level where you can um, solve mathematical or prove mathematical theorems, is considered like a very, very um, good demonstration of intelligence. One of the main reasons, and I think we'll come back to this later, being that when you're proving a um, when you're proving a theorem, the search space of proofs is infinite, um, and so they argue that, or um, and so coming up with the correct answer among an infinite number of possible answers is actually quite hard, especially for a computer because. One of the main ways that computers tend to solve problems is by doing a, a, like a comprehensive search of the, the, the space. Um, so this is actually a really hard problem, and the reason why they're working on it is to demonstrate that they can, that we can, what we can achieve with our current state of the art with machine learning models. Um, and then another reason, and uh, so that's why they're working on. Uh, solving the math Olympiad, and, and uh, then the the other part of it is that they're solving the math Olympiad geometry problems without human demonstrations. So, a really common way to approach ma uh, machine learning problems is to get um, expert demonstrations, whether they're like labels of images or, in this case, like multi-line proofs um, from humans, and uh, just training a model using supervised learning to, to uh, learn how to do something like that. But math is a really difficult beast to, um, to collect data in. Uh, for, for one, I think there are like, the, the, well, the main thing is there's no, like, there's no main uniform language to describe different parts of math. Like in one of the problems that they have here is they actually end up using a geometry specific language to describe the problems, which means they can't translate this method directly to solve like algebra problems. Um, so there's no, there's no language for it. And even if there was, this language has to be something that uh, can be um, understood by a machine or at least create, uh, not understood, but uh, generated by a machine. Um, and so basically, that makes it really hard and there's like very little data in the in this in this problem like for, from humans and that's specifically true of geometry so they chose geometry because it's a domain of mathematics where there's very very little data that you could train a model on based on human demonstrations um so overall what they're trying to show is like okay we're going to create a model that has like genius level uh, reasoning capabilities in one field of mathematics without having to, to train it on human uh, data. Um, and uh, so I hope I've motivated why they worked on this problem. And um, the approach that they take is, I think there's a good, let's see, there's a good diagram here. Um, actually, I want to go through the diagram a little bit later. I'll give you the overview. I was I don't think there's an over, a good overview. Um, no, there's not. So the the uh, overview page. So the approach that they take is that they um, create a synthetic data set of geometry proofs. Uh, well, actually, the first, yeah, that's what we'll we'll start from there. they they actually no, the first thing they do, sorry, the first thing that they do, is that they, um, well, let me go back one step further because in order to explain that, uh, 
like there's there's two current state of the art methods in this field of like solving geometry problems. Let's go all the way down. Actually, they they say it over here. Man, I'm forgetting where it is, so I'm sorry, but you'll just have to listen to me for this part. There's two different ways of solving these geometry problems. One of them is um, by converting the problem into a problem of like a, a problem of like basically solving for polynomial coefficients or something along those lines. They basically complete com convert the geometry problem into a polynomial and then they solve it. Um, and this is called like Wu's method. Uh, I thought it was it, it was cool because it's basically a while back I saw this YouTube video and I just wanted to to like do an aside on this this YouTube video uh, called the biggest project in modern mathematics and it's about this uh, component component of math I hope you guys can hear me well this um, component of mathematics called Langland's program and it shows a uh, connection between number theory and geometry that allows you to solve like geometry problems using number theory and vice versa um and basically this Wu's method that's like the current state of the art and there's one other one like it they're both methods which um convert this geometry problem into poly a polynomial problem so like into a different branch of math and are able to solve the prove the geometry problem that way the problem with these methods is that they um are not interpretable because you're solving a geometry problem in a different field of mathematics which probably ends up just being like a ton of numbers like you say well if i can reduce this polynomial to this or something along those lines then this is a true statement or not um and so uh that's that's and also it's very computationally efficient like they in in the experiments that they performed in this paper uh they took wu's method as like the baseline of this type of this type of approach and they said if the if the solver can't solve the problem within 48 hours then we're going to say that it wasn't able to solve the problem because um with this method there's a guarantee like a theoretical guarantee that you can solve i think any geometry problem um i'm not sure if it's any or most but there's like theoretical guarantees around being able to solve these things but it's very compute efficient and the proofs that it produces are not um are not uh interpretable at all so that's one branch of how they used to solve these geom geometry problems automatically, like with some kind of algorithm. I think it's really cool because it, like I said, it exploits the fact that you can connect different branches of math and pose a problem in different ways. But then there's also um, like basically a search-based method, uh, which is called, which they call over here like symbolic deduction. And um, what that is, is that you describe the premise is in your problem statement as a set of um, like a set of logical statements. And then you have a, um, an, a symbolic engine, which is able to figure out like what conclusions are entailed from these by combining these different premises, basically like the conclusion space of these set of premises. And so um, the other state of the art that exists here is um, uh, you have these what they call like symbolic engines you can see that over here and they can take a set of premises and just tell you what the conclusions are um, however these types of methods have a, 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 a an, an issue in that like sometimes you have to add what they call an auxiliary point or an they also call it an exogenous term which is basically you have to add an additional uh, premise to your um, proof, which isn't in the original state, like problem statement, in order to prove whatever you're trying to prove. Uh, I think there's a, kind of a good visualization of this right over here. So it's saying like, let ABC be any triangle where AB equals AC, uh, prove that like ABC and ACB are equal to each other. So prove that those two angles are equal to each other. Um, they have to add what they're calling an exogenous term an auxiliary point, which is they construct a, another line from he, like they add the point D and they construct the line here and they say like, okay, this line is perpendicular to BC 
And um, so they're able to show that the, the, that's how they're able to prove that uh, these two angles are equal to each other. So uh, these symbolic engines, which can take a set of premises and then tell you what the conclusions are, they, they can't add these auxiliary points into the proof. Um, and so that's their limitation. And then up till now, uh, what's gone in this area of um, using symbolic search, the uh, main um, state of the art has been a set of heuristics that humans have said like, okay, when you, when you, hit, you haven't proven your um, statement with the premises that you've um, been given, then here's some heuristics to add auxiliary points in order to try to prove it. Um, and so the, the, um, the, we'll get back to how the method that they're using differs. Uh, and it's mainly in terms of how they deal with adding auxiliary points. But in terms of the methodology they use to train the model, which is what I was trying to explain originally. Um, so they take a symbolic uh, engine, they augment it, or they take like one of the state of the art engines, they augment it by adding like an algebra solver in there too, which we'll go into later. And then they have this like really good solver, which can tell you what's the logic that's entailed uh, that can be concluded from a set of premises. And then they get like a set of, I think like like thousands or millions of premises. Um, and what they do is they sample premises, like a set of premises from this set. Um, and then they run it through the solver to create uh, a proof. So they get their premises, they have their proof, and then the, there's probably multiple things that can be proved from a set of premises. They choose one of them. And then that's they have their they have an example of like premises, uh, what you want to prove, and then the proof for it, and they generate a hundred million um, synthetic theorems, so like a hundred million examples, um, and then they train the the they train the model on those examples. Um, that was a I thought that was a pretty cool way to train the model. Pretty yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I th I th the whole thing is, I think there's a lot of intelligence here. And also the fact that they're really focusing. Um, oh, okay, so they train the model, um, but then the, the model that they're training, they, so they created this data set with 100 million examples. They, but they don't train the model to just like prove things. They actually put the, the, the symbolic engine or this deduction engine in, in, in like an iterative uh, loop with the, um, with the model, which is what they do is that you put the premises that you have into the symbolic engine. It tells you what conclusions it can come up with. Then you feed those into the model and it generates an auxiliary point. So a new piece of information that you can use to make further conclusions. And then you feed that into the symbolic engine and you get more proofs. And you continue to do this until you've either proved the theorem or you've run out of um, either compute or time. And so that their, their uh, model is actually a combination of uh, this old school, like just logical solver or deduction engine and uh, a neural network that they've trained on these synthetic theorems. Um, so yeah, and, and they're able to achieve, achieve really good results. So that's their kind of their overall approach. Um, now let's go into some like uh, more interesting detail. Um, first, I want to go over uh, data set creation. Um, so let's talk about how they made this data set. Um, and so let's see, is there anything I want to say here? Ah, no, OK. So they, they have this engine, as I said, this deduction engine. And I'm just going to show you the, symbol, the symbols that they use here. Um, and they, they, they first they have this set of premises that they they use to create. Okay, here they say um, we sampled nearly one billion of such premises in a highly parallelized method. Okay, never mind, sorry. Um, so they set they for each point that they generate, they sample a number of premises, then they feed it through the deduction engine, and that gives them the conclusion n that they want to uh, come to, and then they are they have a proof related to it. And they view the whole thing as a graph. So like the premises could be thought of as like 
the the leaf nodes of a graph. Um, actually, yeah, in the as the leaf nodes or the root nodes, whichever ones you have a graph, it's actually kind of a, it's, it's, and then the um, n is either like the, the at the opposite side of the graph, like the the leaf node of the proof, and then the the graph is the proof itself. Um, they show an example of what this all looks like is, so this could be, um, they basically construct geometry problems by like constructing these triangles or circles and so on. Um, and there's a set of premises here, then they feed it through the deduction engine. They choose a, um, they choose a, one of the examples, I mean, one of the conclusions of the deduction engine, and then they, uh, they get, they look at the tree uh, this is like the next step after they they put it through the deduction engine they look at the, tr the the graph related to it which is like a directed acyclic graph from the premises all the way to like the conclusion you're trying to show so in this example they're trying to show that h a is perpendicular to b c um wait no yeah i guess that's what's trying to show it doesn't look perpendicular to me but anyway there's something i'm missing here but anyway, it doesn't matter for the purposes of explaining this. Um, so you you uh, choose your conclusion, and then what you do is you actually have to go back through the graph and find the minimal set of premises that were required to prove this um, this premise, uh, because otherwise your your proofs could be like large and have like a lot of redundant information in it. In fact, like uh, they had to implement like they had to implement very specific um, and pretty interesting different uh, tools to reduce these proofs down to their smallest size, like basically make these directed graphs as small as possible given the information um, that is uh, required to like prove whatever the, pr the theorem is that you wanna prove. Um, and even after they created like these very specific tools, they also just take all the premises within the proof and they one by one will remove them and test to see if you can still prove the theorem to make sure that it's still, to make it a minimal um, example. So to generate these examples, there's actually a lot of, of good proofs. There's a lot of compute that goes into like making sure that they're as succinct as possible and don't have any additional information. And that has to do with pruning on a directed acyclic graph, which explains the logic. Um, so they create this data set of examples where you have P as premises, N is theorem, and G is the proof. Um, and then, uh, okay, we'll go back. We'll go back to that in a second. And 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 then they train the model on it. But there's a couple of things that are interesting elements of of of, of this whole thing. Um, so. The point that I told you before uh, about like how this language model is used is that it's not actually used to prove the theorem. It's used to add auxiliary points or like auxiliary terms, exogenous terms uh, to the proof. So some information that's not in the original premises that you can use to um, to uh, prove the theorem. and. Uh, they have an they have an explanation of what what that means, like how they do that here. Um, and I thought this sentence and then the diagram I'm about to show you explains really well what they did. Uh, so they say, in other words, they're trying to find auxiliary terms. And the way they do is they find the dependency difference between the conclusion statement and the conclusion objects. Um, so what does that mean? So over here, I think you're trying to prove the statement uh, H A is perpendicular to B C or not, um, and so there's two lines that are required. Or uh, sorry, there's three lines that are that are required for for, for you to have H A and uh, and B C, which are like actually yeah, which are um, B to D, E to C, and then A to H. Um, but in order to prove this statement, they actually have to add another line, which is E to D. So this E to D would be considered um, a dependency difference between the conclusion statement and the conclusion objects. The conclusion objects are those lines that I just mentioned, like B to D, uh, E to C, and A to H. 
but the the conclusion statement is that either these things are these two lines are are parallel or not i mean are perpendicular or not so um that's that's an object that's required for the conclusion statement but not for the conclusion objects uh, so i hope that gives an idea of how they figured out what auxiliary terms were in the state in the in the proof so so and the, so yeah um, the in, in this example does it mean that the ed is, is only necessary to prove the theorem but it doesn't um it doesn't sort of uh it's not necessary to to make the statement true no it's that um in order to 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 uh you, like the you're trying to make a conclusion about h a and b c these two lines yep. so there's a set of premises which are required to construct h a and b c um like to, to, to make the, the diagram the way it is, to make those yeah. lines. And then there's a set of premises that are required to show that they're perpendicular to each other or not. Yeah. So the difference between those two are auxiliary terms. So it would be that the auxiliary term is required to prove or disprove the theorem, mm -hmm. but not required or not required to state the theorem or to describe yeah. the theorem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's these, yeah. these would be the, the the sort of things you you construct if you want to prove it essentially where the sort of intuition of, of mathematicians would come in yeah exactly gotcha thank you um and so what they do in their data set after they've created it is they look for this dependency difference and if they find an auxiliary term they actually move it out of p so they remove it as a pre a premise and they put it in the proof um for when they're training the model so this way uh the model has examples of um proving a theorem where it actually has to generate and it's learning to generate the proof like where it doesn't have access to all the auxiliary terms beforehand um so that's like a really key step in how they create the data set uh one thing i found interesting is they created a hundred million examples of proofs uh, by like basically doing some kind of uniform sampling across the premises that they had available, but only nine million of them had auxiliary terms, um, and very uh, and the of those nine million, I think it was like very few of them had. Uh, where does it say? Very few of them had more than one auxiliary term, um, which shows that very few of them. Uh, like most most of these proofs don't require an additional like exogenous term to solve and you can see that in the results because like one of their uh methods is just using this this dd plus ar is their deduction engine and um it's able to solve 14 of the 30 questions without doing any adding any uh, like what they're calling auxiliary constructions over here um so but you do need them um Okay, I think I think I'm gonna go over the uh, deduction engine a li little bit more here uh, before we go into like how the model was trained. So they use the deduction engine to create all these proofs, and then they use this dependency difference to find ones with auxiliary terms in order to modify the data so that the model could learn to generate auxiliary terms. Um, but uh, they actually had to take like a state of the art deduction engine, which is what DD is, and they had to augment it with an algebra with algebraic rules. So they actually created an algebraic solver um, to be part of this deduction engine. Uh, and what that does is it allows them to like say, okay, if this angle is equal to this, then this angle is equal to this. Create an algebraic equations that you can solve in order to perform the proof which wasn't in the like the state of the art before they worked on this paper. So this augmentation is also just making these these deduction engines a little bit better. Um, yeah, so that's one of the, the contributions of this paper as well is just making is, is also making these deduction engines by themselves better. Um, OK, we've gone through all of that. So I'll talk about how the model is trained. The model is a, um, and what the model, let's actually, sorry, let's talk about what the model is. They call the model a language model, uh, which I guess I, I would agree is a fair term, but uh, it's a transformer that's about, I think it's like um, 15 million or 150 million parameters. Um, 
with an embedding layer, like a vocabulary of about 756 words. So it's not using natural language as the language it uses to describe proofs. Instead, it's using like a geometric language that can describe the mathematics of it much more succinctly because it has a lot less, the vocabulary is a lot smaller than that you would have for a natural language uh, vocabulary. Um, so it's a transformer with a, a special geometry based vocabulary. Um, and then they, uh, they train it in two phases. First, they train the model for on the 100 million um, examples that they have of all the proofs that they've generated. And then they train the model on another 9 million examples that have auxiliary terms on it where they fine tune it. So it's basically like pre-training on all the proofs and then they fine tune on the proofs that have auxiliary terms because all they want to do is use this model to generate auxiliary terms. Um, so, oh, uh, I don't know if we should go over this now. Let's 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 talk about results. I actually am going to go back to data set construction a little bit more because I really found felt like that was the interesting part of it. Um, we talked about baselines that are. Uh, based on like transforming these into large polynomials. Um, we talked about heuristics, so let's look at the results. So um, this is these are the results. So you have of, of like alpha geometry is the model that's trained on this data set that we've talked so much about. And it also what it, it works the way we, it, we said it does. You get a deduction engine, you solve, you use it to create all the premises you can, the conclusions you can. You use alpha geometry to create a new term, then you do it again and you do it iteratively until it solves it or not. Um, and so uh, these two uh, transformation into polynomial based methods, they can only solve four and 10 of the problems. And they say in the paper and experiments, I think, where do they say it? They, they said, if, you, if the method can't solve it within 48 hours, then uh, we stop it from from running and we say it can't be solved by this method. But I think, like I said, there are some guarantees that you can solve like most problems. Oh, it says, that, okay, these methods have a theoretical guarantee of that they can successfully decide the truth value of all geometry theorems here. So yeah, these, these methods actually can solve all of these problems, but the, com the compute required to solve them is more than 48 hours. Whereas uh, for, um, alpha geometry and all these other methods, I think they gave it, they have, they gave it a, an hour and a half or four, four and a half hours per problem. Um, so GPT-4 uh, just train, was asked to, to, to provide proofs for these, to solve the, 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 uh, the test set. Um, and it was only, it wasn't able to solve any, but this is GPT-4 asked in like natural language. So basically it's like if we went on to, OpenAI's um, platform and said like solve this geometry problem. It wasn't able to do any of it. That does that seems pretty makes sense to me. Then all of these other uh, methods are the search based methods we talked about. So the full angle method is another uh, state of the art which um, does some kind of search and it's able to solve two of the problems. Then the deductive database is the one that they uh, started out with and then augmented. It's able to solve seven of the problems. The deductive database plus these heuristics to add auxiliary terms is able to solve nine. Then there, the, the de deductive database plus al the al uh, algebra solver is able to solve 14. Um, and then when they ask GPT-4 to help by adding auxiliary terms, it's actually able to solve one more. Okay, and then so when they use their method plus all the human design heuristics for adding auxiliary terms, they're able to solve 18. But with alpha geometry, they're able to solve 25. So um, one thing that's one thing you can see is that um, like the the even just adding the algorithmic solver made it able to solve five more problems. So there's no deep learning that they did to to get these model this uh, solver to be better. Um, but then adding in deep learning to ge generate auxiliary terms is able to actually increase the amount of problems that it can solve by 11. So that's actually a much bigger increase in like improvement. Um, and then they show that without pre-training, so if you just fine tune it, it can only solve 21 of the problems. 
And if you uh, don't fine tune it, then it can solve 23. So that pre-training on like all of the problems, even the ones that don't in include auxiliary terms is pretty important for its performance. Um, one, one quick question, yeah. if I may. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I might have completely missed this for 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 the solving. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it has to come up with these these uh, auxiliaries, right? Mm -hmm. Does it does that step because it involves several potentially several um, auxiliaries, right? In order to, to find the solution, does it also like like sort of prune, like like it it, it, it tries several auxiliaries and then prunes it like like these typical deep mind approaches work these the search space ones or yeah they so good question yes they do uh so what it, the way it works is that you use the, the the engine and then you use the model alpha geometry to generate a single sentence so like and that's your auxiliary term mm -hmm. and they they say over here um over here they say where is it Oh, man, I'm sorry. Give me one second to find it. I know they, they use like 512 parallel searches at the same time. It's either 512 or 256 mm. parallel searches that they're doing at the same time, looking for the best one. Um, yeah, let's see. And they use beam search to, to, to find the best one. So they're not using... They, um, sorry, yeah? go ahead. Uh, how, how do they evaluate whether a, a particular premise is is, is 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 looking promising even though a single premise by itself might not solve the problem do, do they is that part of the training that's a good question i'm not sure but um maybe it's something along the lines that they only really need to they only need to add like one or two auxiliary terms at most or maybe three so i don't see i could see that uh, they don't have to do something super complicated, but I see, I see. all they tell us here is that they use beam search. They don't show. No, I can't find it. Hey, where is it? Where is it taking us? Okay. Ah, uh, I guess for beam search they just use uh for beam search they use likelihood. So they, they're not you, they're not taking into account the auxiliary term as part of the so, so they're sorry they're when they're when they're querying the model they use beam search in terms of likelihood to find the best auxiliary term, mm -hmm. but um, they don't they don't take into account the the symbolic engine like the the deduction engine to to figure out like whether that's a useful term or not I think they just use likelihood. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Using the score of each beam, yeah. So they don't take into account the deduction engine. They stayed over here. Um, so I guess it's a bit it's a bit random search there. Yeah. So um, they have like, like several uh, like like a model that evaluates the the oh it, it it gives it allows you to sample from the premises, and and mm -hmm. I suppose at some point they, they have to test whether any of the premises lead to the to the correct conclusion. Afterwards, they. They might take only the, the I don't know ex most promising looking premises and, and and deepen it from there, right? Yeah, something like that. But how would you know which one is promising, right? Well, that that's I guess the the for the model to, to have been trained on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all based on the model. Um, is is there the <laughs> I, I, I was wondering whether because they generate a lot of data and, and, and theorems, right? Is there a chance that it sort of just finds theorems, memorizes them, and then these, these Olympic problems happen to be already in the training set at some point? Yeah, so supposedly none of these problems are in the training set. Okay. None of the ones that they tr they, they tested on are in the training set. And they said, they, they point out that like the fact that they made 100 million problems and none of them are these ones that they're training on. Shows just how big the the space of problem is. Problems is that they you would solve need to that you could solve if you had like a generalized solver. Um, yep. uh, so cool. yeah, these these are test problems, not uh, shown in the training set. Um, so yeah, you see this really big improvement in performance. 
And if you, you can see over here how, how it performs. So the previous state of the art before this paper was 10 problems. And the, like an honorable mention in the math Olympiad is 14.3 uh, points. So you get 14.3, right? And then a gold medal list gets 25.9. So they got it near that, pretty impressive. Um, okay, so uh, let's see how much time do we have. Okay, uh, just a couple of things. So I've shown you the results. I hope I've given you a good idea how the method works. Now I wanted to dive into some stuff that I thought was cool. But right before I do that, um, here's an interesting uh, figure. It shows you like, uh, like um, almost a histogram. Yeah, a histogram of how many uh, problems there were in the data set that had a certain number of lines in the proof. So like a lot of them had only one line or two lines. And then the average length of, um, the average length of a, of a problem from alpha geometry is like a proof is like 50 lines. Um, the average length for like this really hard problem uh, is 112 and then it's like 187 over here. But you can see that like there's a massive uh, skew towards short proofs, which makes sense because they, there's so much, so much of their uh, data set creation is about making the proof as succinct as possible. Um, so that's all they're really showing here. It's interesting, they, they choose specific problems and you can see them over here in the extended figures. I have to go back. They have extended figures that aren't in the paper but are in um, after it. They choose a couple of problems that are like really hard. Um, I think it's, where is it? Uh, uh, it's like this it, this problem specific problem is considered incredibly hard, and the, they show you that alpha geometry is able to show prove it, but basically that it's just like really really long. Oh, it seems like, um, and you, this guy uses comp wow, this guy uses complex numbers to prove it. But this is a, a, a solution from the actual uh, actual math Olympiad versus um, alpha geometry. Anyway. So, okay, let's go to the cool stuff that I was talking about before. That's in the method section. Um, this is just explaining like what language they used um, and then how they augmented it with the algebraic solver. Um, pretty simple stuff. Um, but so a, a big a big part of their, uh, is it over here, is it over here? Okay. A, a, a big part of um, their method or their data set creation is about coming, like I said before, coming up with a min minimal proof. And that's what all of this part is about, is that how they actually did that. Um, and I can give you some examples of why a proof might be longer than it needs to be. Um, so for example, say your proof relied on, on the logic that A is equal to C. It's also pro possible if you show that A is equal to B and that B is equal to C to show that A is equal to C. And so if you need this, but it might be that this, this is already stated in some other way. So there's like these equalities uh, statements that can, that can occur in the, in the proof. And depending on like how many you can come up with, uh, it's really easy to create like much longer proofs than they need to be. Um, and so the way that they uh, deal with that when they're trying to minimize proofs is they actually create a graph. Um, so they say like, if A is equal to B, B is equal to C and C is equal to D, uh, and then you wanna show A is equal to D, they create a graph that shows edges, all these edges, basically connecting all of them. Show, so the, the edges in, in, uh, mean uh, equality. And then when they're going back through it, they're just making sure that you have like the shortest path in this equality um, graph between like the two variables that you want to show are equal. Um, and they have to do the same. So this, this, this has to do with how uh, equality as a, as a, like a, a part of a proof can lead to like much longer, longer proofs because of what I just described. But there's other uh, geometric um, 
uh, geometric properties that have the same issue. Uh, the two that they mentioned here are collinearity and consinclicity. Where consinclicity is that you can draw a circle that includes like all the points that are concyclic. Um, and for these, they actually have to create hypergraphs because where a hypergraph is like, I think of it as like multiple graphs that are connected to each other. Um, because like you could have a set of points that are concyclic. You could have one point that's concyclic with many other, many sets of points, but those other sets of points might not be concyclic with each other. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, but so for those, they had to find like a minimum minimum spanning tree in the hypergraphs that they constructed in order to reduce like the size of the um, of these of of these proofs. Uh, so they did a lot of like search-based methods on graphs in order to minimize the size of these groups of these proofs. And then for the algebraic part of it, they had to post it as a mixed integer linear program. So um, all of this stuff for me was like, well, this is really cool. I had to post finding like the minimum set of uh, equations required as a mixed integer program. All of this stuff is really cool, but um, it's also so like, it takes so much intelligence to do these things, especially based, I mean, with the average person. So it's like, there's still a ton of um, domain knowledge in this approach. And I think a lot of that is just because we don't have like a good language to describe math problems in generally. Um, because if we did, then we could like, then we, then we could create massive data sets or we could even just use like problems in different domains to train this one if the language is, was the same. So um, yeah, to me, I, I guess all of this, what it made me, as like I'm, I'll finish here and we can take questions. The main thing that was a takeaway for me from this paper is this result is super impressive and they were able to accomplish a lot, but it also shows like how far we are, like how 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 far we have to go in terms of formalizing math and unifying math in order to be able to like train a general purpose proving age model because. We, right now we just don't have, like this model can only solve Euclidean plane geometry. Um, and anything besides that it can't do, it can't even do. And that's because like even within geometry, they don't have something that can easily solve all these problems. Um, but yeah, super interesting paper, cool to learn. I had to like look up so many different things of like math, mathematical terms when I was doing it. So it was a bit of a refresher on math for me. Um, but yeah, I thought it was very interesting. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have now that, now that I'm done going through it. Would, would the next step be to build a machine that, that is able to generate and evaluate different languages to, 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 to formulate a problem? Right, because if you think about many of the greatest breakthroughs, people you know they, they observe something be it in, in properties of numbers, so then they started coming up with new definitions and, 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 and stuff. It looks like a new language, right? Mm, yeah, it, true. Like calculus. Yeah. And and the, the actual symbols don't matter, right? Especially for a machine, the, the symbols don't matter. Wouldn't would that be possible to <laughs> create a large enough data set size to, to build a machine that, that looks at observations and, and sort of builds a language around it? But it might as well become just a uh, conspiracy person, right? Someone, someone that, that sees patterns and everything might might actually be also such a machine that that, that sort of fits patterns into other patterns. Also, I don't know. Yeah, true. I don't. I don't know. Um, my feeling is that we there's no next step for machine learning. It's more a step for. Um, for for mathematicians to to try to to unify things a little bit more, um, yeah. but new concept discovery, as you're talking about, is a very open problem. And maybe we'll make progress in, in machine learning. Maybe we'll make progress in like new concept discovery, and then we'll be able to do exactly what you're saying. And it won't be the mathematicians who 
in my math, but it will be the machines. <laughs> Maybe eventually the, the philosophers will start pulling their weight a little bit more and, and contribute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> Um, thank you for the paper. This is really good and really interesting. I was reading others, and in another paper that I just posted in the chat, um, they this, uh, someone comes to the conclusion that sim um, symbol manipulation fundamentally creates new symbols, not new meaning. Mm -hmm. And I find that this is really interesting because with these auxiliary statements, essentially they are um, creating new meaning. Mm. Leaning on that meaning. So, from that point of view, this is super uh, interesting. And also, I noticed that their code and their models are available in GitHub. Yeah, I think even the data set is available, which is cool. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with what you said. I actually I was trying to read a book on the history of mathematics, and the author argues that, like, one of the greatest breakthroughs that humankind ever made was um, that they created a new uh, way of writing numbers where they they basically created a ba ba they came, came up with the idea of bases without realizing it. Yeah. So before there used to be like a number for 12 and a number for 24, but two times 24 didn't equal 12. They were just like, um, and then they started, they said, okay, we're gonna count to like, nine and then we're going to put a one in front of it and that's ten yeah um, and yeah so all this kind of new creation of symbols can have a big impact as well it, if if it has new meaning with it yeah yeah right that, that's the i guess it describes a new relationship yeah yeah, yeah very interesting Cool. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and I hope we'll see you here next week. And have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That was very cool. Thanks yeah. very much. Yeah.